Welcome to Listen In. I'm Brian Gahan, and this podcast focuses on the stories that are buried deep inside all conversations. Be it the kind of conversation you have with someone whose life experience is full of interesting POVs and insights, or the kind of conversation you have inside your own head around your own life experiences. Today, in episode 13, I'm talking with novelist and award-winning screenwriter, Alon Mustai. Alon shares the story of how a movie changed the course of his life, the importance of getting out of your own way as a creative person, the difference of writing for screen and novel, and his book on life and relationships through the lens of time travel, and how getting the science right opened up all sorts of creative and exciting story possibilities. Hi, Brian here, and just before we jump into this episode, I wanted to take a second to comment on the audio. Alon was in LA, and I was in Toronto, and the internet goddesses, well, they were somewhere else. So the audio from time to time goes a touch wonky, but bear with us, it does bounce back, and your patience will be rewarded. Now, on with the episode. Well, hello, Alon. Thanks for being on Listen In. Uh, Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you. I think you have a very diverse background. But first and foremost, you and I share um, something in common. I was uh, born in Powell River, British Columbia, but grew up in Vancouver. But I also moved to Toronto. Oh, yeah. Powell River. I've been there many times. Um, A really good friend of mine lived in Powell River, and they had a summer place uh, on Savory Island off the coast. So I used to go up there every summer. In fact, in Powell River, I was introduced to the greatest treat of all time, which is soft serve ice cream mixed into a Slurpee. And there was a place in Powell River, and I can't remember what it's called, but they used to do that. And I remember going up there one summer and this being introduced to me by my friend Matthew, who lived up there, and it blew my teenage mind. (laughs) Well, it's kind of like a root beer float, but on steroids, right? It's total sugar. (laughs) And I mean, in a normal city, you know, you'd have to visit at least two separate establishments to create such a thing. But in Powell River, this mecca of summertime sweets, they would do it in the same shop. (laughs) That's what happens when you're in a small town, right? Up the coast with not a lot of access to other things you have to compromise. You start experimenting. Exactly. Multitasking. So... You know, and the one thing that the reason why I wanted to bring up the move to Toronto concept is because a lot of people would say to me, you know, you kind of went the wrong way. You don't really hear of many people going from Vancouver, you know, to Toronto. You hear of people going the other way. So I was curious, what what was your journey? What brought you here to Toronto? How did you end up here? Well, um, I've been kind of going back and forth, actually, for a number of years. I, I, what first brought me um, to Ontario was university. Um, I, as you mentioned, I grew up in Vancouver. I was born in Vancouver and raised there. But I went to Queen's University in Kingston. Um, and that was the first time that I kind of came out to Ontario. In fact, I, I knew so little about Ontario growing up in Vancouver. I didn't actually even know what Kingston was. I, In fact, up for the first six weeks, up until Thanksgiving, I actually thought Kingston was west of Toronto. I realized I had mixed it up with London, Ontario. And trying to get to Toronto for Thanksgiving to visit some family, I suddenly realized I was actually east of Toronto. So that was a big (laughs) thing. Um, But I went to university at Queen's, and then I came back to Vancouver, and then I did my master's degree uh, in Montreal, and then went back to Vancouver. So there was a lot of back and forth um, for me. And then finally, I ended up in Toronto in a longer term way because the woman I was dating, uh, who's now my wife, got a job offer in Toronto, both working uh, in film production in Vancouver. And that brought us to Toronto for what turned out to be a much longer stay. Okay, yeah. See, I came for the restaurant business. I was working in the restaurant business in Vancouver, and I got offered an opportunity in Toronto. So I came here for what I thought would be maybe two years. And I then fell in love with the city, and I haven't moved back. Um, I still have all of my family in Vancouver. I do go back and forth, but Mm -hmm. I've made my home in in Toronto. So uh, we have something similar in that. Yeah, my family is all still in Vancouver as well. It's a beautiful place to be from, I mean, to get to visit uh, and see family, but also get to spend time in Vancouver. I always feel it's a real gift. Um, Yeah. It's such a nice place. 
Yeah, it is so beautiful there. And, uh, you, you know, you sit and you look at the harbor and the mountains and yeah, it just, it's breathtaking. But anyways, that's nostalgia. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's really interesting, though, and I wonder how you feel about this. Like, I, I really love Toronto. I think it's a vibrant, exciting, um, and just like a terrific place to live. Um, it's interesting, though, because I, I feel like in the world, there's two kinds of cities, you know, there's cities which are set against a geographical backdrop, like Vancouver, where you have the ocean and the mountains and the forests, and anything that humans build seems kind of paltry, sort of puny compared to the grandeur of the geographical environment. Um, whereas there's places like Toronto, and of course it's on Lake Ontario, but on a day-to-day -day basis in Toronto, the biggest thing you see is human-made structures, you know? Right. New York that Chicago's like that, London's like that. A lot of major world cities are like that, where the the, the dominant scale is human. And I, I think about that a lot as a writer. That I grew up in a place where the dominant scale was like geological, was geographical, and how that affected me and the way I see the world. And I wonder about you know I have two kids who are growing up in Toronto, and I try to get them in places as often as I can where the scale is is more geographic than than man made or human made. That's a really interesting way to see it, and I and I wonder if that is from a writer's perspective. In other words. You know, do you do you see the world like that? You know, you see it. You see it in sh in in shapes and how humans have interacted with it, um, as opposed to just oh, it's pretty. Yeah, I mean, I I think it actually on a really deep level, it it really did affect the way I see the world. Like I I have a tendency to just as interested as I am in. Um, Kind of like the the the, con the things that humans make, whether those they're physical things like buildings or technology or the sort of the the, the um, philosophies or ideologies that we create to kind of give our sense our life a sense of purpose or meaning. I, I, I have a tendency to see all those things as like constructed, not natural, um, and to really think about how um, everything that we have in our world is built easy when you get used to it to think of it as just being like a natural or inevitable part of our environment but actually all these things are built and they, and if they're built they can also be taken apart right right which takes me into the concept of you know a segue into your your uh, background as a screenwriter mm. because you know I, I was reading an interview with yourself and you you commented about how a screen play is more like a blueprint that people build on yeah. I mean, well, this is the thing about the difference between screenwriting and novel writing. I mean, when you read a novel, you're reading the words that I or that other novelist have, have, have written. Your experience like of the story is through the words that the author wrote. Whereas when you're watching a movie, the screen, you know, you write a document, you write a screenplay, but you're not reading the screenplay. The words are then translated into a completely other artistic medium. They're translated into images and sounds. Uh, the cinematography, the editing, and of course, more than anything, the performances, the actors. And so it's, it, it, it's you know, an architect blueprint is a good metaphor. Uh, a, a composer's, like, you know, the score that a composer um, builds is then performed by an orchestra. And you don't sit there in a, in a theater um, or concert venue reading the score, right? You right. listen to the symphony. And so it's, it's, it's interesting in that way. And as a screenwriter, you, I think you have to be very aware of the artifice and all the the construction that goes into creating an experience that will hopefully be totally seamless for the viewer, right? Like when, when somebody's watching a movie, you don't want them to see the seams or the stitches or the kind of hard edges. You want them to just disappear into the into the world like it's a dream. But as a screenwriter, you're very, very aware of the construction because your contributions are only seen like in reflection. Right. So explain to me your journey in learning how to become a screenwriter. How did that happen for you? Well, um, you know, I was really interested in writing from a young age, um, storytelling. I don't know. I just, I, I think I just was one of those kids who just really, I loved books. I also loved movies. I loved storytelling in general. But the idea of becoming a writer uh, and making a living as a writer, it seemed very, very far off. I wasn't sure how you do that. And so I, I, I tried to find kind of a more practical, quote unquote, ways of making a living. And I thought that writing would just be like a, a hobby that I would love, but that I wouldn't necessarily be my, my main profession. 
And, uh, you know, so I explored a lot of different ways of, of working in, in and around the film world because I, I loved film as well. And, you know, I, I did everything from working on, on set, like on movie sets. I edited educational videos and I directed, like, I did some, like, working commercials. Uh, I worked at film festivals. I wrote movie reviews. I, I taught uh, at a university in film. I did all these kind of things. But all the while, like, I was writing and people seemed to really like what I was writing. Like, I kept getting opportunities to write stuff. And when I would get up those opportunities, I would, they would often lead to other opportunities. And so even though I sort of thought of writing as a, a hobby that there would be very difficult to make a living doing, I kept getting a lot of positive feedback. Whenever I got the opportunities to write stuff, people would want me to write the more stuff. And, and so my, I, I kind of just kept getting drawn back to writing and drawn back to writing. And eventually it occurred to me, well, um, like people seem to actually be liking what I'm writing and why am I creating this personal op like why am I saying well I'll never make a living as a writer why, why don't I let the world tell me that you know why don't I if there's going to be this obstacle why am I the one creating the obstacle the, like the world will provide more than enough obstacles to you know get in in the way of, of following whatever your professional or creative dream is don't be the one that's also creating obstacles right so just try writing and see how it goes. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, but don't fail before you've even tried, you know, don't decide you're going to fail before you've even tried. So, um, I started, uh, taking it a little more seriously and started getting my stuff out there. And, and I was really lucky. I, I got rewarded really quickly. Like, um, as soon as I started, you know, the, the more and more I wrote, the more opportunities, kind of professional opportunities came my way. And, um, within a few years I was able to start supporting myself exclusively as a writer. And so it, it was an interesting thing. I mean, I, I, I'm very lucky. There was a certain amount of like being in the right place at the right time, um, having my stuff land on the right person's desk when they were looking for something that was similar to what I was doing. But at the same time, I, a lot of my early, um, impediments were self-imposed more like a, a perception of how, how impossible it would be. And so it, you know, don't even go down that road as opposed to, what actually happened when I started trying it, which is that things happened for me relatively quickly. Yeah, that's a very interesting concept for, you know, not just young people starting out in their careers, but anybody who's trying to find, you know, their way or their passion um, is the, the whole concept of, you know, it, it, yes, things are hard and you have to work hard. We all have to work hard, but it should still come relatively easy easily for you meaning that if you are aware of the signals that you're getting back you will get positive feedback in the path that you should go down and i had a similar story to that i was working i never saw myself as a creative person i was working in um, the restaurant business i was working in the real estate business and and then i started to take up photography and I started to notice that anytime I interacted with anybody in the photography world, they were just really nice to me, you know, <laughs> like I'd go into the film lab and the people that worked there would smile and say hello. And then I would drop my film off and then I'd go off to my day job and people would treat me like crap. And then I'd go back to my kind of hobby and I'd realize, you know, it's just I, I don't know how I'm going to make money here, but I kind of like the people and the way I'm treated here. And so my passion just kept growing and you know that led to me becoming you know a creative person working in the advertising industry for 21 years yeah i mean i i i feel that as well like i think when you actually are able to pursue this creative path that's passionate for you like of course there's going to be obstacles there's going to be a incredible amount of hard work there's going to be frustrations but it, when you find yourself doing the thing that you really care about that you really love it's easier to overcome those obstacles because you because it, it, it's it's in the world that you want to be in when you're because you're going to face all those obstacles and frustrations like even in a job that you hate and it's to make it all worse because you actually don't like it or not necessarily a job you hate but a job that you're dispassionate about that, that, that isn't like meaningful or fulfilling about so why not face those same obstacles and frustrations in an area that you really love Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Like, I, I love the way that you put that. Uh, just the whole concept of don't be don't be your own obstacle. Yeah. I mean, and I think it's a thing that a lot of young people have. And I mean, frankly, like grownups as well have to overcome because um, you're, you know, you're, the, you're given all of these sort of preconceptions of what doing a creative job is. And of course, it's hard. 
and it can be it, it's not necessarily going to be immediately rewarding and you also have to get like good at it and that is a huge thing because when you're starting out you you know you have all this idea of what your stuff should feel like or look like or sound like and it's 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 not going to be as good as all the things that you love and that inspire you, you know, like your writing isn't going to be as good as the novelists or screenwriters or poets or whatever it is that inspire you to do it. But also you're not seeing their early work, right? You're seeing like their fully fleshed out, uh, finalized, finished version of it. Like you're not being exposed to their like half baked first draft. You're only being exposed to your half baked first draft. And so there can be that frustration. So you have to really have like your eye on the long term, getting better, working hard so that you can get to a place where uh, where where your work is, if not as good as the people that inspire you, but getting closer and closer. And that and that feeling that it's a muscle like um, like running a, a marathon or swimming a long distance, like you, you can't just wake up one morning and run a marathon. You have to train. And I think it's likewise with your creative endeavors. Like you have to actually apply yourself to get better. And in doing that, you, you it's like when you're focused on your craft, um, a lot of other things fall into place. Um, I think a lot of people, especially in like film and TV and, 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 the, and, and the publishing industry, focus on all the um, industry side of things, you know, getting an agent, getting a publisher, but if you, but when you focus on the craft, that's a part of it that you actually have control over. You know, it's really hard to have control over whether a publisher is interested in you, whether an agent wants to represent you, whether you know you're getting hits on social media or, or whatever is your metric of success. But if you focus on your craft, if you focus on waking up every day and trying to get to be a, just a, a fractionally better writer, that's actually a part of the process that you that's that is under your control. And I loved what you said about you know you never get to see their early work. I mean, that is, that is so wise just to remember that because we all, we all aspire to be, you know, we've all seen that movie that made us want to be a movie, you know, a filmmaker. We've all read the book or gone to the play or seen the painting or heard the music that makes people want to follow that uh, path. But yeah, you don't get to see the early stuff and the early stuff will show you like, oh yeah, you know, like uh, I can maybe do something similar to that. Right. You know, you know I, I think of like when you go to like the student film festivals at like the art colleges, you know, and you'll see people at the beginning of their careers and they've made their little short film. You know, that's a good place to start judging yourself if you're just a beginner trying to get into the film business is look at what people a couple of years more advanced than you with some more training than you were doing and then aspire to be that as opposed to, you know, <laughs> the next Scorsese or something. Well, I, I, that's the thing about film school. I've said this to, like, I, I went to Queens and I studied, um, I, said, I mean, I studied English as well as film. Um, but I've said this to my professors, like, years later. When you're in film school, just like when you're studying, you know, when you're studying English or whatever your area, when you're in film school, the only bad movies you see are the ones made by you and your friends, right? You're only watching masterpieces. They're not showing you crappy movies in film school. They're showing you like the greatest movies of all time. And then you go out and make your little short films and they're terrible compared to the greatest movies of all time. In fact, you, every movie that you make or that your friends make, whatever the promise are, you know, total garbage compared to like the masterpieces of the, of, of the medium. And I think it's I think it's actually like it can be really hard on young aspiring filmmakers. Um, after film school, you know, I worked as a assistant programmer at a film festival where we would watch hundreds of submissions and the majority of them were terrible. And that's OK. Like that's, you know, the majority of them would never be seen by anybody except a few unfortunate uh, junior programmers. But it actually was like probably the most like inspiring thing for me not that oh these movies are terrible i can do better than that but like oh these people have gone out and made the movies the movies aren't that great but i can see what's wrong with them like i'm watching them and i'm saying okay like this doesn't work this doesn't work um this oh that was really interesting like they kind of got to an interesting place there but then it fell apart over here and by watching all these terrible uh sort of failures <laughs> i mean i'm not going to mention any of them because it's like obviously these are people who like worked really hard, raised the money, spent the time, made the movies, finished them, submitted them to the festivals. The movies didn't work out. Um, but like I actually learned a lot from watching those. And in a lot of ways, I learned a lot more about screenwriting and storytelling on film from watching like hundreds of films that didn't work than I ever did watching like 
dozens of masterpieces in film school. And I, I've joked with this, um, but sort of joking seriously with my, some of my old film profs, like you should just show your students like 50 terrible movies because that's going to make them feel like they can do it much more than showing them 50 masterpieces. Or show them, you know, uh, famous people's, you know, first work, right. right? Low budget, not a lot of skill and talent yet, but a lot of passion and drive and show them that and say, you know, there's a straight line between this film and what you what you know they won an Academy Award for, but that straight line is you know 15 years of hard work. I mean, 15 if they're lucky. And I, and again, let me, let me say, like watching masterpieces is good too. You should do both. <laughs> like you should have the aspirational, but also the like functional of the functional of like, oh, this is what happens when it doesn't work. This is what happens when it does. And 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 to realize that, that you know you're gonna you're gonna start in one place and you're gonna go towards the sort of the horizon of creating you know work that truly works on all levels. Welcome back. I'm talking with novelist and screenwriter Alon Mastai, who is talking about the serendipity around the movie that changed the course of his life and the surprising encounter that allowed him to say thank you. On the note of, uh, you know, inspirational movies, do you have your, like, top two, three, one uh, movies that you feel changed your life or, or motivated you in, in a big way? A huge one for me is this film. It's a Taiwanese film called Yi Yi, um, written and directed by Edward Yang. Uh, it's called Yi Yi. I think the subtitle in English was a one and a two. And this is a movie that when I heard about it, I mean, it just sounded terrible. Like I was like, why would I want to watch that? It's like a two and a half hour family saga set in in Taiwan. And it just sounded like, well, why would I want to watch that? That sounds like so boring. Um, and in fact, the only reason I watched it was I was working um, at the Toronto Film Festival, the Toronto International Film Festival as an assistant, um, you know, getting people's uh, dry cleaning and doing their schedules and that kind of thing. And it was the last night of the festival and I was so burnt out and all I wanted to do was go home. And I was actually feeling a little like burnt out on movies because when you're working at a festival, there's all these incredible films, but what you're really seeing a lot of the time when you work there is just like the back, the, like how the sausage is made, how movies are bought and sold, the kind of the business side of it and, and all the kind of deals and all the salespeople. And it, it, I, it was kind of depressing and it made me sort of feel at this time at a young age, like, I don't know, maybe this isn't for me. Like it didn't, wasn't feeling creative. It was feeling like a, like a, like a job, like a sales conference. But, and, and I was actually so tired that I didn't think I could catch the subway home. I felt like I would fall asleep on the subway. And so I looked through the schedule and I looked for the most boring movie I could think of. Mm -hmm. I, I, and I was like, I'm just going to go to this movie because I had a pass, which I had barely used because I'd been working at the festival. I'm going to go see the most boring, the longest, most boring movie I can find. And I'm going to have a nap. And that longest, most boring movie was Yee Yee, a one and a two, this Taiwanese film. And so I went to the movie theater and I was like, I'm just going to like settle in and sleep. And the movie is brilliant. I mean, it was just so mesmerizing, so funny, so thoughtful and insightful, so uh, moving emotionally, so thrilling on, uh, on a storytelling level. The idea that I could walk into this theater intending, literally intending to sleep through the movie and just be transfixed by the story of this family that I, I shouldn't have any reason to care about. But because of the the filmmaking technique and the storytelling verb and the passion of the filmmaker. I just loved it. And it just, it really saved movies for me. It made me love what you can do, um, what you can do in cinema. And, and so I kind of went from a place of like being literally exhausted to being so excited. And I was so excited by the film that I, instead of going home to sleep on the last night of the festival, I had been invited to this party. And I went to this party because I was like feeling great about movies and excited and I, and, I, and I was full of energy. And at that party, I met the woman who would become my wife. Oh my gosh. Wow. And so, yeah. And so I, I think about uh, films that are, are seminal to me and there's certainly films that I love, but no movie has like changed my, the course of my life more than Yee Yee. Oh, wow. That is such a great story. Like that really, have you ever been able to share that story with the filmmakers? Actually, I have. Not the filmmaker, because unfortunately he passed away. He died of cancer. Um, but through weird circumstances, 
I was having dinner with Jackie Chan, the Hong Kong, uh, you know, yeah. uh, movie star. And uh, I don't know why I had to explain. Everybody knows who Jackie Chan is. <laughs> um, I was having dinner with Jackie Chan and there was this woman uh, with him at the dinner and she, uh, she was there and I didn't, I got her name, but I didn't quite understand what she was doing there. And, and, and it was because she was there considering working with Jackie on like a, on a, like a biography or documentary about him. And I, 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 you know, she seemed very nice, but I, I didn't have a huge uh, opportunity to talk with her. But then at one point, I think like Jackie left the table and I just started talking with her and I discovered that she was Edward Yang's widow. That like she had been married to him and she was a close collaborator of his and she actually, um, she's actually in Yi Yi and she worked as like a production designer. And anyways, this, this woman, um, was actually his widow and I was able to tell her the story and it was really touching for her to know how much his film had had that effect on me. Um, you know, and so it was a really beautiful opportunity for me to be able to kind of like um, talk to this woman and, and tell her about how much her, her his work meant to me and also her work because she was actually part of mm -hmm. um, she was part of his films as well. And I think for her at the time, I feel like she was feeling like, oh, maybe his work, you know, because he passed away and he wasn't able to kind of continue working um, that maybe like he wasn't having the same kind of effect that he could have. There's been a real like a criterion's put on out all his movies and um, and like they're all available now. And, and but I still feel like he's one of those filmmakers that hasn't really like because he passed away after making a couple really wonderful films. Um, I, I really recommend seeking them out. Um, her name was uh, was Kaylee Peng. I mean, still is Kaylee Peng. And um, Anyways, it was it was a lovely opportunity to kind of talk to her uh, about how important his works are. It had, the work was for me, and Yi Yi is a wonderful film. I also recommend A Brighter Summer Day and That Day on the Beach and Taipei Story, all all terrific films. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. That is that is such a great story, and it it sort of it it, it sort of takes me into sort of some questions I have around you know your your screenwriting, and I'm wondering did. Has has the magic of that experience filtered into into your storytelling? Like, have you have you made that movie of you know, <laughs> boy goes to movie to sleep to meet the love of his life? Um, I mean, yes and no. Like, I, my work tends to, when I write autobiographically, I tend to write um, more like what the the feeling is as opposed to. Um, like specific, like telling that exact story on, on film or, or even in a novel, you know, my, I tend to be like, how did that feel? What's a fictional story that I can tell about that? Or what's a story where I can, um, you know, like use that feeling. So I wrote this movie, the F word, um, which was released in the U S as what if, uh, and the F word stars Daniel Radcliffe and Zoe Kazan, Adam Driver, um, Mackenzie Davis and Rafe Spall was directed by um, Mike, Mike Dez. And that, that is a movie about, um, like, what happens when you meet somebody and you feel that like sense of like connection and it's just like a random encounter that changes the trajectory of your life. You know, that's a movie about, um, you know, yeah, what it feels like to meet somebody and just be drawn to them and have that sort of like that chemistry, that immediate chemistry, that spark of connection and that, that feels so like vivid and effervescent, um, and, and how those kind of human connections change your life. And I, it's something that I write about, I think a lot, um, is, the, the kind of the romantic connections the sort of more friendship connections, but how human connection and how that sort of spark of meeting somebody in the right circumstances can take you off in a, in a totally different direction. I'm kind of private about my personal life insofar as like, I, I love writing and I love sharing these stories and I certainly use the, the, my own emotional material as fuel to tell stories about fictional characters, but I kind of like to keep my personal stories mine alone, you know, me and the people who are intimate in my life. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe as I, maybe in the future, I'll get more comfortable with that, but there's something about the personal story that I, I just like them to be mine. That's probably a very, um, valid emotional response as an <laughs> artist, right? Is, you know, you can, you can use them as fuel for your creative process, but you don't need to expose them sort of thing to the world because that could change it. Yeah. I mean, it's a very complicated, I think in our, in our modern era, there's a lot of people whose art is based on almost literally kind of taking the material of their life 
and mm-hmm. and presenting it out to the world, whether as in nonfiction or even as fiction. I know a lot of writers or or filmmakers whose 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 creative output is very much like a a, a barely veiled you know expression of their real lives. Um, and I, I, it's not that I don't think that that's valid. I, it's just I worry about the effect on your personal life when you turn everything into material. You know. Mm-hmm. I think if you read my novel or, or watch a film that I wrote, like the F word, like you will know me very, very well um, from reading from reading that book or from watching that movie. You will have a very strong understanding of who I am, what's meaningful to me, how I see the world. But it's not a memoir. Uh, you know, it's not. So these story, it, the, the worldview is perf- is very accurate to the way I see the world. The emotional tenor is very accurate to how I experience the world, how I feel life but it's not a but it's not an autobiography right it's not um it's not nonfiction. it's still fictionalized and so that line between like emotional or philosophical accuracy versus like autobiographical expression is an important one for me to maintain to go back to the f word movie um i'm just curious why was it called what if in the united states or elsewhere <laughs> and, and then the f word in canada right uh, the F word was the original title. I mean, it's, so, you know, we should joke the dirtiest word in romance, friends, because it's sort of like a modern expre- ex- exploration of friendship, particularly male, female friendship, and where the line between being attracted to somebody as a friend versus something more, something romantic, how those lines get messy, the better you get to know somebody and how the chemistry you feel with somebody can kind of change your perspective and, and kind of take you in a direction you never intended to go, a direction you may not even want to go. Um when we re- we when we released sold the movie in the U.S., uh, it's very it's it's actually sorry it's not that interesting a story. It's just the MPAA, the ratings board in the U.S., said you basically can't release a movie called the F word in America if you want to advertise it publicly. Like if you want to have posters um, on walls, if you want to have billboards, if you want to put it on the side of buses, um, you can't call a movie the F word. And our distributor in the US uh, decided to change the title so that they wouldn't run afoul of the MPAA. Uh, in Canada, our distributor E1 in Canada just felt like that was ridiculous and they loved the title and they felt the very thing that was that scared the, the American ratings board uh, was what they loved about it. They loved how kind of like edgy and kind of like provocative the title was, but that the movie itself is actually quite, um, you know, like like there's a sort of a, a sweetness and an, 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 an emotional resonance to the film, but the, the title kind of gets your attention. And so it was just a, you know, it was really like a cultural difference. And some countries released the movie as the F word. Other countries released it as what if, um, depending on, on their on their ratings. So it's it, we sort of ran into the um, linguistic periods of, uh, of the American ratings board. Yeah, no, I, coming from the advertising world, I used to run into that all the time and, you know, different, di- even just in different regions in different, you know, areas, like between certain suppliers of, let's say outdoor billboards, one would put something up and one would not. Yeah. I'm going to ramble here a little bit because I'm going to tie in the concept of film festivals and, uh, and then, you know, your film, because I went to a short film festival years and years and years ago when the only time you could see this kind of stuff was if you went to like the Blur Cinema and uh, spent that weekend watching a bunch of short films because they there was no online. You know, this is back in the 90s. And I saw this, this, I think it was a Swedish film that was like really low budget, locked off camera, uh, a woman in a kitchen with a big pot of boiling water, like she's making pasta or lobsters or something. And, you know, and then there's steam and there's heat and there's this whole setup that something bad is going to happen with this hot water. Like it's, it's she's going to hurt herself or something. Smoke detector goes off and she's waving a towel and she climbs up on the kitchen sink to wave the smoke detector and she falls out the window. And that's the end of the movie. And everybody in the movie theater just sits there and feels like, oh, my God, that was horrific. And and then I watched your movie and I thought, you did that so brilliantly. It was so funny. And like the setup with the jalapeno in the eye and then the, the, the like the fact that he was the one that opened the window in the first place. And then the way you summed it all up with, and you say it, if I remember twice, don't move. 
So after Ben has fallen out the window and is lying unconscious on the ground, she says, don't move. And I just found that scene so well written and so funny. And it was just such a juxtaposition of what I had seen in this other movie that mm. left me feeling like I just witnessed the most horrible thing in the world. To to the humor and 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 so like I see that scene as being a a big part of you. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I, I love that sequence in the F word, and uh, I'm really proud of you know how of, of maybe not the writing on it, but also how Mike directed it, how the actors performed it, and even just how, in terms of like how, the set we built, and we all really love that scene. And I mean, what, when you watch it in the theater with an audience and like get that kind of like intense explosion of laughter it's really really rewarding um yeah i mean for me like it, it's a couple things we you know uh, the, the movie's quite talky especially you know uh, in the first um you know 15 20 minutes and uh, i you know i love uh you know like funny rich dialogue but I, I i and you know i mean like the movie's full of that but i i also feel like as an audience like you can get a little full up of it and so i wanted to create a sequence um where you get a surprising physical explosion of laughter. Because I feel like, you know, t these kind of tensions build up in a movie. And if you can find ways of releasing them in surprising ways, um, you build, a, number one, a lot of goodwill for the audience. And it's also kind of like, like, um, like you blow out that tension and, and you have a chance to fill the balloon back up again. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's a lot going on in that scene in terms of um, – Dan, uh, you know, like Daniel's character Wallace meeting Zoe's character Shantry's boyfriend for the first time. Her sister's there, which you know, kind of like confuses him and throws a whole wrench into the dynamics. And you have this, you know, really like um, naughty four-way kind of conversation happening. And so when you suddenly build all this physical humor into it, and the the um, very very careful but hope it hopefully it was very carefully constructed but hopefully feels effortless physical comedy of the moment the audience doesn't see it coming and so it's an even bigger explosion and being able to build that sort of cinematically and structurally into the movie it's one of the really fun things about storytelling because you you when you're watching with an audience and you know like they're laughing at certain things they're following certain things and, and you know that they have you have this surprise that's like built <laughs> That they're, not, that they're never going to see coming. I mean, now if they watch the movie, they'll see it coming. Sorry, we just ruined it. <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a, you know, the, it's one of the fun things as a storyteller, knowing like you, you've, you've laid this, like, I mean, a trap in a good way for the audience that they're going to get kind of sucked into and, and, and be, be shocked and surprised and have this huge reaction. It, it's, re, it's really, really rewarding. And, yeah. and there's little things we did in that. And, and so a, actually it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, that set in the, in the movie, it, like we, we were at that set several times. We actually very intentionally, um, that's one of the only sets that we really built because the movie's shot in a lot of natural locations. Like we just used real locations and, and took them over and, 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 you know, dressed them uh, for the production, but we just used real environments. We actually built that set for, um, even though we use it for a bunch of different scenes, exactly because of that, that window scene, mm -hmm. because we, we built it on a second floor we designed the whole space because we wanted you to be able to see out the window and to see literally that it really is the second floor of a building. Um, and so when he falls, because it was like if it's a third or fourth floor, he's like really badly injured. If it's a first floor, um, nothing's going to happen. Like it's not going to be a big deal. We, it had to be a second floor. We were very, very – we wanted the exact right amount of, of – um, of drop. So when you're seeing out the window, when you don't even know where the scene is going on a visual level and a geographic level, um, you're registering the actual height. Um, and it's like very subtle and it's a real testament to the director, Mike, who, who, you know, to Mike Douse, who understood that, that even though you don't know where the scene is going, you are registering visually that you are actually on the second floor of a building. Um, you see traffic go by outside, all that stuff. So when it goes out the window, it, it, the, the fall feels, um, much more real because we are in a real space. And those are the kind of things that you that you think about when you're making a film, how you're going to – and those things really enhance it. And we built all these different parts of the room so that we could do the mechanics. And, and because we um, had used real environments through the whole movie, again, it's a subtle thing, but you, you – you, the, the audience sort of like absorbs that all of these are real environments. So that, that even though we're actually in one of the very few um, built environments – 
the rest of the movie has been in real environment, so you don't question it in that way. And so these are all the little things that you do in a movie to make a sequence like that, which feels just like this big kind of like physical comic laugh. Um, but you're doing all these subtle structural things to make sure that it, it has the largest impact possible. Yeah, and that's great to hear you explain it because I, the, like, for one, I thought it was very funny and very well done. And 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 you're right, you built up all this tension that you thought was going to be awkward tension between him and 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 Ben and 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 her sister. Like you, you know, like you thought everything else was going to happen other than what actually happens. Right. <laughs> you know, like so you're waiting for something else, and then and then I think that. The other takeaway, because as a as a person who's you know I've done television commercials and I've worked in 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 different creative elements where you're always I'm always curious how people do stuff. What happened to me right away was I went, I can't believe they got a location that was so perfect for that scene because I thought it was a real location. And I mean, it is a real location. Like we took over a building and then redressed the interior of the building. So it's like it's not like we like. It's not like it was green screened or built in a movie studio. We just took over a, a building and made it look like an apartment. And because we had been using real apartments, real houses, real workplaces, real coffee shops, like, you know, we were able to kind of conceal the artifice. But it's not like we it wasn't like a, it's not like green screen. Right. It's, it's real place. Uh, yeah, it's it's that kind of stuff is super, super fun. And, and it's, it's rewarding to hear that it had that kind of impact on you. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that. And just sort of riffing off the last thing you said, I mean, there's a lot of expectations the audience might have going into a scene like that. As a writer, I feel like my job is if you, whatever you are expecting to happen, that can't happen because if that happens then it's not really like, why did we even give you the scene? If the audience can guess what's how it's going to end from the beginning of the scene, then, then, then the scene doesn't work dramatically. It always has to surprise you. And sometimes you can play with that. Like you can give the audience or the reader, um, a couple expected things, but to me, if you're giving them a few expected things, it's only because you're going to subvert or upend those expectations. And if you're not going to subvert or upend those expectations, why even tell the story? I saw a quote of you saying that, you know, you, you don't start writing till you know how something's going to end. Hmm. And and so then when I think of romantic comedies, we almost all know how they're going to end, right? The boy and the girl are going to get together, almost in all of them at the end. So is that harder to write then? Because you you you're you're not you're not surprising me at the end necessarily. Hmm. Uh, you know how they get together, you're surprising me. But so is the challenge as a screenwriter when you're writing something like a romantic comedy is 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 that so much harder than let's say a, a thriller or a, or a horror show, you know, like, or whatever, like something where the ending can just be anything like any twist and you're good and you're done. Um, y- yes and no, like, yes, absolutely. Because we typically know how romances work. Um, that, 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 you know, either the couple is going to end up together, uh, or they're, or they're not. And if it's sort of more of like a downbeat, bittersweet ending. Um, but I, I think I try to think about what it's like when you experience it in life, like you meet somebody and you fall in love and you develop a relationship and you get married and you have kids and you live a life together. Um, and that's a very, that's like an expected pattern, but when you're living it, it's not expected. You know, when you meet somebody for the first time and you're starting to get to know them, like you don't know how this is going to turn out. Right. I mean, it's like, like a first kiss can be like the most boring, uh, thing on, on screen. But if it's happening to you, it's not boring. The first time you kiss somebody is never boring. Right. And I think about what it feels like when you're inside the experience. And so my job as a writer, um, as a storyteller, is to ideally put the audience, whether it's a reader or a viewer, inside the character's perspective. And so what you're experiencing is the, the tensions and the awkwardness and the yearning uh, and, the, and the thrill of being inside that experience. Um, so I, I feel like if I can keep a, a handle on that. Then, I, then it's then I'm OK. You know, I mean, with with the F word, you know, we, we, we try to run the line where you're not necessarily sure. Are you watching a movie which is going to have like a, a romantically happy ending or are you watching a movie that's going to be like a, like, a you know, one of those like bittersweet indie movies like 500 Days of Summer where where you actually have like a downbeat like like bittersweet ending. Right. And so, you know, you try to maintain that that tension through the film as much as possible. But 
Yeah, I think in a romantic comedy, I think when they work really well, it's not about whether the ending is a big shock or a surprise. It's about whether you 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 fall in love with these characters and you want to spend time with them and you want them to get over whatever the obstacles that are in their way in order to find happiness at the end, you know? And so um, if there's a theme of the film, it's, it's that you can't lie your way to happiness. And... Um, that experience is what I want people to really, um, to really like follow. And so, yeah, I mean, you can't work. I mean, I, I knew how I wanted the movie to end. And so you work backwards and you make sure that all the things you're doing in the film, like that, that, that the pleasures of the movie aren't dependent in, in a romantic comedy. I think the pleasures of a romantic comedy can't be dependent on the ending. You know, it can't be like, Oh, I'm going to be so shocked and surprised or blown away by the ending. Um, and a thriller, you can do that, right? Like if you're in your, if your thriller has like an incredible ending, um, great. But I think in a, in a romantic comedy or in a lot of comedies, you have to make sure that the pleasures of the film are, are in the experience of the story, not in how it ends. Welcome back. I'm talking with novelist and screenwriter Alain Mastai, who is discussing his book, All Our Wrong Todays, and how it helps close the loop on the future we were supposed to have, but didn't. I want to sort of like, you know, transition into talking about your book. And sure. um, I I know that I know that you're, you know, you, you grew up as a big sci fi lover. Um, and I do know that um, your grandfather had a had a big influence on you around uh, legitimizing, I guess it is the science behind sci fi. Uh, do you want to you want to share a little bit of that story? Sure. I mean, um, when I was growing up, my my grandfather, my mother's father, um, you know, we spent a lot of time with my grandparents. And my grandfather, who was a chemist, um, he had a he was a big sci fi fan. And he had this. Uh, I remember this bookshelf uh, in my grandparents' house, which was lined uh, with all these old vintage science fiction paperbacks and um, all the old kind of like anthologies from the 50s and 60s, uh, you know, anthologies of science fiction, short stories. Um, and I, I, I love them. And, and But I particularly even found myself drawn as a kid to like these garish painted covers with, you know, robots and um, spacemen and aliens and, and you know, all, all these sort of like um, incredibly vivid images uh, of the sort of science fiction um stories in these science fiction futures. Uh, and I found that kind of stuff fascinating. It really captured my imagination. But even as a kid, um, I, there was like a, a contradiction there, like a, like a tension there, because, you know, a lot of these stories written in the 40s or 50s or 60s, you know, I was as a kid in like the 80s, like some of these stories were set in what was the future for the authors in the 50s, but was already uh, the past for me as, a, you know, like if you read, like if you read Orwell's 1984, but you're reading it in 1985, you can say, well, that is not what 1984 was like. Um, and I, I was really interested in that contradiction. And I got more and more interested in as I get older, like what happened to the future that these these writers and artists imagine, you know, this sort of Jetsons like techno utopian future that seemed just around the corner in the post-war era. What happened to that? Um, and, you know, my, and sort of following on the other point, my grandfather as a scientist, like he was a huge sci-fi fan, but he used to get very frustrated because, you know, he felt that as much as he loved the stories, they always cheated the science. You know, they always faked some kind of some kind of like nonsense to make the story work. And he, off, he always felt like the actual science, the real science is super interesting. And if they would just use take the time to get to understand the real science they could actually make their stories not just more interesting but actually more tangible more accurate more real and more meaningful and so i, I think those two things really um really like fueled the idea behind my novel all are wrong today is um both in terms of wanting to explore what happened to the future we were supposed to have but also trying to make sure um that I was honoring the influence of my grandfather by getting the science as right as possible. Now, was there a lot of pressure on you? Like, was there a point where you had to just stop and go, okay, I think I've got the science good enough? Or like, were you always feeling the pressure to make it as, 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 as perfect as possible? I am, I mean, I'm just interested in this stuff. So my feeling is my, my job as a writer is to understand this stuff as well as I'm intellectually capable of understanding. You know, I do a lot of research, but it's not all in the book. You know, I mean, I, I, I might respend, 
I'm the kind of person who might spend weeks trying to get to understand some sort of arcane scientific concept, but it's only going to be two sentences in the book. Like my, I, I don't expect the reader to have the same level of interest in this stuff as I do. My job is just to make sure that the science feels accurate. So when you read it, it makes sense. It feels true and that it serves the story because nobody needs a, a um, you know, like me to suddenly like spend like, you know, 5,000 words explaining quantum physics to you. You just, it, it, but if you read it and it's accurate, and when you when you feel it, it feels real. Um, that's all that really matters. So I I might I might spend like you know two or three weeks researching a topic, but it's only like three sentences or a paragraph in the book. Uh, to me, it's just what's important to tell the story. It's great when like a like a you know like a physics professor uh, emails me and says you know I read your book and I was really impressed that all the physics checks out. You know um, that that makes me really happy uh, or um, you know or, or whatever the topic because for me it's the accuracy. The scientific accuracy gets a lot of attention, but to me, I want it to be historically accurate. I want it to be psychologically accurate. You know, one of the first people I ever gave the novel to was a, was a psychotherapist I know because I wanted to make sure that the characters made sense. You know, that I that I, I wanted her to read it, just like you might get a physics professor to read it to know if the tra the physics of time travel makes sense. I want a psychologist to read it to tell me if the psychology makes sense. I want a historian to be able to read it and say, oh, these historical references totally check out. Um, so to me, it's not just the science; it's everything. But definitely, my grandfather's influence was was a sort of a real spur to make sure that that that. I, I was taking that stuff as seriously as possible while never get, making it get in the way of the story. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and I find it kind of this interesting connection where, you know, the sci-fi stories of the past, uh, you reading them, you know, kind of after their, 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 their shelf life, so to speak, and realizing that it didn't come true, made you go and write a sci-fi book kind of explaining the, the, how that could happen Right. Well, actually getting the science right enough that your book could potentially happen in the future, right? right? Yeah, it's I mean, that's what's fun about it for me, um, to kind of take the things that influence you. But if, to me, if you're just spitting out your influences, um, then it, that, that's why do it. You know, you want to provide a new spin on it. So for, for people who don't know the book, I mean, All Are Wrong Today is um, when the book starts. It's set in the present day, but it's like what people thought 2016, 17, 18, 19, like what people thought the present day would be like from the perspective of the 1950s and 60s, like what somebody in 19, in 1955 thought 2019 was going to look like. Uh, but we don't, so that's where the book starts, but that's not where it, where it ends. And part of what I'm ex exploring, as you mentioned, is like what happened to the future we were supposed to have? How did we end up with the world we're in today instead of that sort of, you know, dazzling uh, techno-utopian future that we imagine for ourselves? And so uh, while most of the book actually takes place in our, in the real world, in the, in the, in the world we all live in, uh, it explores that question of like, what happened? Where, where did it all go wrong? When my book provides what I hope is a very entertaining answer to what went wrong. Well, I have to make a confession. I'm not a huge sci-fi fan. Not that I don't like it. I, I, I don't know why I never gravitated towards it. I know that, um, you know, I'm the youngest of four, so my siblings were all into, you know, uh, Star Trek and all that stuff growing up, and mm. uh, and I kind of moved over to Spider Man. Like, you know, I I wasn't a Superman fan. I was kind of more of a Spider Man fan. So I don't know if I was rebelling, but so I've never I've re I've read some sci fi, but I have. It's not a genre that I embrace. I'm more. Um, I might go more mysticism than science, mm. but. I found the way that you wrote your book with the short chapters and then the summary where you go in, I think it's on page 106 or something, and you go in and you go like, you know, summary of chapters 1 through 43 or whatever. And the fact that there's 43 <laughs> chapters by 106 helps people understand how short the chapters are. But I found it so easy to get into the book. Like, and, and to learn the science and to understand and get pulled in, in a way that I hadn't, I hadn't really felt in other types of sci-fi books. Right. Well, part of that is a reaction to, oh, sorry, I cut you off. You were going to say something. No, 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 that's, that's totally fine. I, I was just going to say, and so I was curious about the style, like how you chose to write it, like in these like short chapters. And then, as I said, the summary the summary to me was kind of like, oh my God, I get it. 
right? It's like, it all... It's, yeah, I mean, that's good. That's great to hear. And that's all intentional. I mean, I you know, part of it is I was really into sci-fi when I was younger, but then I drifted away from it for a long time. Um, I, and I think part of it was like some of this stuff felt kind of childish to me, not like childish, like there's not sophisticated, mature science fiction, but it was a thing that I was into when I was younger, you know, and then I drifted off into other genres, other, you know, I mean, I would just, I like reading, I read all, all up and down through different genres, through different literary forms. And I just think, it, and I drifted over also into the film world. And, and so science fiction was, was a thing that I had a huge amount of affection for, but I associated with my adolescence and my relationship with my grandfather. When I kind of revisited a lot of these ideas, um, when I was older, I, I was kind of approaching the genre from, from somebody that had stepped away from it for a long time, but had a huge amount of affection and like a pretty deep well of, uh, like a deep reservoir of knowledge of it. Um, so I wanted to write a science fiction book that would be, that would work really well for science fiction fans. But if you've never picked up a science fiction book and all you know about sci-fi is sort of what you've absorbed from the pop culture, it would still totally work for you. And, and so I, I tried to approach these um, certain conventions, the genre with a fresh eye. I tried to approach them from the perspective of somebody that doesn't have a huge knowledge or even affection for the genre so that, the ideas that I'm exploring, like you don't have to know anything about sci-fi to uh, to kind of, to kind of get into them, because ultimately it's much much more about this character's psychological and emotional journey, and about the questions that he's asking, and about the answers that he finds, than it is about the the sort of you know the the rocket ships and and and, and you know time travel and uh, flying cars and all that kind of stuff. Um, so to me, the, the the science fiction, while I wanted to have a huge amount of affection for it and take it really seriously, um, it's really more a, a psychological study of this character, and it becomes the frame through which we understand his story. Uh, in terms of the short chapters, like and part of part of part of that is the short chapters. Like I wanted the book to be as welcoming as possible. You know, I wanted to write a book where if you have only five minutes. Uh, you know, everybody lives a very busy lives. If you only have like five or 10 minutes in the morning or in the evening or on your commute to work, like you can read a chapter or two in five or 10 minutes. You know, I love the idea that you can like have a, 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 a coherent storytelling experience with just like five or 10 minutes of your day. Um, if you have a whole afternoon to sit and read like 30 chapters, that's great. Like, I mean, I want you to read as much as possible. And the best compliment I get from readers is when they tell me, oh, I, I was reading it on the subway and I missed my stop or I stayed up to, I was only going to read for 20 minutes and I ended up staying up really late because I just had to find out what happened next. Like, that's my job as a storyteller is to write, is, is to keep you turning pages until like it ruins your life. But, <laughs> but I also want, I want people who are really busy, whether you're like a, a mom juggling kids or, or a busy, you know, like a, somebody who has to commute to work every day or, or whatever is going on in your life, you can still have like a little storytelling experience. that can be part of your life. And so I, I and so that idea of like, having science fiction that works for sci-fi fans, but also works for somebody who's never read science fiction, uh, having a, a book that's structured that you can read it for, you can read like a, a three page chapter and that's, that's it. Or you can spend the whole day reading the book. I, I, I like my work to be welcoming in that way. And that is, I mean, that, that is a great overview of the book because that's exactly how, how it felt to me. I mean, you, you, read it quickly because it was only a commitment for the next page or two for a chapter. And you think, oh, well, I'll, I'll finish at the end of that chapter. But then, you know, you got into it very, very easily, I felt. Um, and I also love the fact that, it, you know, as you said, it's about the, it's about the personal character. It's, it, it's about, it's about their emotions, their feelings, what they're thinking, what they're going through. And, even though they live in this sci-fi sci-fi world, they're not really a sci-fi kind of person. They're just a human, right? right? And that's part of the voice of the character too. Like, you know, I think one of the things that I, when looking back at these old stories um, for research, you know, everybody's so excited about all the technology and it's all like, you know, the stories stop for 10 pages so they can explain how all the technology works. But that's not how we experience technology in the real world. Like, I mean, I have a cell phone and my cell phone is, you know, what the, the the cell phone I have in my pocket is this like incredibly powerful supercomputer connected to this like international network of information. It can do all this incredible stuff, and you know the the, the cell phone in my pocket is the most power would be the most powerful supercomputer on Earth thirty years ago. But it's not like I walk around staring at it in awe, or or if I was writing a story set it today, I, I would ha I have to spend 
10 pages of my novel explaining how a cell phone works. We're very blase about the technology we have. I don't even know how this thing works, right? And so, like, I mean, I have this cell phone and I use it every day, but it's not like I could really explain how the technology works. And so I wanted a narrator that had that perspective about all the amazing technology in his world, right? It's, if you, you know, it's not like when I drive to work in the morning, I have to explain to the reader how a combustion engine works, right? Like, right. so I wanted, I wanted a narrator who was not that impressed with all this technology, because that is how we would be in the world. We're much more concerned about whether we have a good Wi-Fi signal than we are about like the quantum physics behind a cell phone. And so that aspect of it to me, like a narrator who was like funny, tongue in cheek, didn't take it all too seriously, like w was an important way to get into this world in a way that I hope that wasn't going to that was going to appeal to readers uh, and wasn't going to push out anybody that that wasn't going to like be a barrier to entry for anybody who I I isn't like, you know, it I isn't necessarily somebody who like loves knowing how things work because right. this guy really know how everything works. He does his best to explain things when it's relevant to the story, but he's not like super worried about, about like explaining how every little thing works because you wouldn't do that in the real world. Yeah, no, that's very, that's, that's a very good point. You know, you had me when you introduced the concept because I'd never thought of this before, but, and I'm going to paraphrase it here, but something to do with the, the, you know, the introduction of a new technology introduces the accident of that technology meaning mm. like you know you invent the car you've also invented the car crash you know um i i just found that that thinking fascinating like i was just like you know that just pulled me into the story of in a way that i hadn't hadn't expected the concept of yeah like we're constantly inventing this stuff that has consequences that's right. And typically speaking, the kind of people who uh, design, engineer, and introduce ne new technologies just by the very nature of, of how they think tend to focus on all the things that are going to go right with the technology, right? They don't focus on all, all the things that could go wrong. Um, and I'm fascinated by the idea of the accident, the, the unintended consequence that every time as you said, you introduce a new technology, you also introduce the accident of that technology. There's no such thing as a plane crash until you invent the plane. And I think there's a responsibility on the part of uh, of society, but specifically like the people who are inventing, innovating, and developing new technologies to think about not just all the great things that could happen, but what can go wrong? Because inevitably, every technology has its accident. Every technology has its crash, whether it's uh, whether it's a steamship or whether it's a cell phone. Um, you know, we've seen through social media, through the internet, through cellular technology, through smartphones, uh, the many ways that all, that there are unintended consequences, whether they're on how a democratic election. Yeah. Uh, is out right on the social connections between people on uh, you know uh, let, let, let me give you like a very benign example like um, many of the weddings I've been to in the last few years are through are people who have met on dating apps right um, like it's actually super interesting now how so many people meet on dating apps and and they clearly work I mean I have people who are very important people in my life who have met their spouses on, on dating apps. I have absolutely nothing against. I think there once was a time where people were a little uncomfortable about it, a little awkward, but now it's just like a very normal part of everyday society. And I, I, don't, I say that in a non-judgmental way. But it's really interesting because it used to be when you ask somebody the story of how they met, they had like a big long story. I even we earlier in this podcast talked about the story of how you know the day I met my wife. Um, but now everybody's story is the same. We met on a dating app. You know, they might have a story about where they met on their first date uh, and, and how they came together. But but how they met is on like everybody has that same story. That's interesting. But more than that, I've been to these weddings lately where because they met in a dating app, there's absolutely no social overlap between these people. When you go to the wedding, not a single person on the bride side knows a single person on the groom side. It used to be people met because of overlaps in their social circles. Right. Mm -hmm. So there would be these connections between them. Right. Um but now when you go to when you go to a wedding by two people who met on a dating app, there's absolutely no overlap at all. Of course, once they come together, there's an overlap. But I, I, I had a friend who met, met his wife on a dating app, had a wedding, 
uh, where nobody knew each other. And then uh, unfortunately it didn't work out and they divorced. And I mean like the split between them was perfectly clean because there was no overlap. And all these things are just like, I'm not, I'm not saying it in a judgmental way. Like it's just interesting. Like we don't like what the long-term consequences of, 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 of like all these, all these marriages, um, the way, the way these people have met, like, it's just interesting to think of the, the long-term consequences of these things. Right. And we, and it's, it's really easy to project the positives of a technology. It's really hard to project the negatives of a technology. Mm -hmm. And because you usually, because life in, in like life as lived is very unpredictable. And so I'm sure, yeah, like I, 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 I'm sure that the inventors of Facebook had no intention of dis of yeah. disrupting the U S election when they in introduced their, uh, you know, their social media app, like everybody, er, er, people go into these things with positive intentions. I mean, I'm sure they want to make a lot of money, but they go into these things with positive intentions and life has a way of, of making things a lot more complicated. And so I think that there's a responsibility to think about this stuff as a storyteller. It's very rich. You know, I love thinking about not just the accident of technology, but the accident of people, every person you meet has unintended consequences on your life. And they may be very, very minor, or they may be very, very major. Um, and so when you take that idea of the accident and you apply it not just to technology, but also to people, start, then you start to get into the stuff that makes storytelling worth, worth doing. Welcome back. I'm talking with novelist and screenwriter Alon Mastai, who is sharing how trying to get the science right around time travel opened up all sorts of creative and exciting story possibilities. I want to um, talk a little bit about time travel uh, because you have done your due diligence and dove into the science behind it in a way that um, a lot of other storytellers maybe have uh, taken some liberties on. And, uh, you know, I, and I think that you were referring to it, no one takes into account the astrodynamics of time travel. You know, the fact that we are hurtling through time and it's not just about, you know, walking from one door to another door into a different time zone. Yeah, I mean, it's something that I've always found really curious. Like we act like you can like it, you can just walk through a door into the time. But we know, of course, that the Earth is constantly moving. Right. Even right now, as, as we sit you know, you, if you're in a room and it feels like you're like you're not moving, but of course you're actually hurtling through space at hundreds of miles an hour. You know, the earth is spinning, it's rotating around the sun, the sun is moving through the Milky Way, the Milky Way is moving through uh, uh, the universe. Like we're actually all moving at like, like unimaginable speed. And so if you were to go back in time uh, three seconds, you would be a mile away. Right. You can't. And the idea that you could go back in time, even to yes, if you were to go back in time to, to yesterday, you wouldn't be in the same place physically. You'd be in the vacuum of space. The Earth would have already moved many tens of thousands of, of miles away. Um, and so I like the idea of exploring how time travel would work if you actually took astrodynamics seriously. And if you actually thought about the fact that the Earth was constantly moving, um, how would time travel work? And what was great about that was, and again, for anybody who's listening to this, like, it's not like I spend like 40 pages explaining this in the book. It's like three paragraphs. Um, but the, but to me, what's really interesting about that is it, 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 it takes the, the physics seriously, but it actually opened up all these really interesting um, storytelling possibilities because to create a model of time travel that took astrodynamics and orbital mechanics seriously required me to figure out all this stuff, which helped me work out the history of this world, this sort of like alternate version of the world, um, what technology would have had to be in place, what discoveries would have had to be in place, who might have made those discoveries. And I was able to, by taking the, the physics seriously, um, it really opened up and added so much more texture to the world and, 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 and evoked these characters who become, of course, if you read the book, key, key parts of the, of the, of the story. Um, and so like my grandfather had said all those years ago, by taking the science seriously, I opened up all these really exciting storytelling possibilities, which um, I think are very, are hopefully for the reader, really like fresh and, and unexpected. And for me as a storyteller, we're really fresh and unexpected. So um, by taking the science seriously, the story got so much more interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And so I would, I would agree and I would recommend everybody 
go and take your book and and spend some time with it all are wrong today's because it it it, it does it opens your eyes up to all sorts of interesting ways of seeing science and the future and life. And, and it's also just a really good, you know, human story, right. Uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's, uh, you. it's about how do you figure out, you know, your life and the future you want to live in. And yeah, I, I think there was so many, there's, there's so many layers to it that, you know, and, and that's the thing that's so great about books, right? You see a book on a bookshelf and you see a cover usually, and you see a name and it just gets richer and richer and richer and richer as you as you start to investigate it, right, or start to read it. I hope so. I mean, that's that's the intention. I mean, I love exploring these sort of scientific and technical and philosophical ideas, but ultimately, I'm telling stories about people, and I think all those things are interesting if they provide a way, expected way, to talk about human relationships. You know, how we find our people, how we find our place, how we find our purpose. What's meaningful to us? What do we mean? Like, what do we mean when we say the future? You know, the future we're supposed to have. What kind of future do we want for ourselves? How do we define happiness? Like, how how do we, you as a person, decide what really makes you happy? And these are the questions that are like eternal human questions. And all this sort of whether it's science fiction or time travel or physics, whatever, all, all this stuff is relevant to me as a storyteller because it provides an unexpected way to talk about like deep emotional human truths. And I wouldn't expect anybody to read the book if it was just about um, how cool time travel is, although time travel is cool. Um, <laughs> and I, I love all that stuff. Ultimately, I'm trying to use these ideas to talk about like what it means to be, a, what it means to be human, what it means to be, um, what, what it means to find your purpose and sense of meaning, what it means to be a son or, or a parent, what it means to be a husband or a spouse, you know, what, what it means to find your place and find your people and how human connections in our lives are what actually give us the purpose and the meaning that make life worth living. Yeah. And I think you did that. Um, so well, so let me ask you this just, you know, and then we're going to sort of wrap it up here, but you know, you're talking about, uh, you know, research and science and then human behavior and storytelling. What's your writing process? Like, how do you how do you keep all of that in your head and together? And, you know, what 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 are your what's the way you tackle it? Well, I mean, I spend a lot of time thinking about the stories that I want to tell. I mean, I, I get a lot of ideas, but not every idea is worth spending a couple of years of your life writing a book or or, or turning into a film. So I, I spend a lot of time just like percolating on things, you know, marinating on it. If there's an area that I think needs some research, I'll do some research, you know. A lot of story ideas start just actually, I'm just interested in some general area and I start researching about it and I start reading nonfiction about it and I start getting to understand like how, how things really work in that, that area. And story ideas kind of spark. Um, and uh, and so and once I've spent enough time that I feel like that story has has is going to be worth actually spending the time on it. Um, then I just, you know, then I kind of like, I, I spent a lot of time thinking and taking notes and observations until I feel like I have the whole story in place in my head. My feeling is if I can't keep the whole story in my head, I can't expect the reader to, you know, like, and so I, 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 I think about it and I, and I percolate on it and I take notes until I feel like I have the whole story in my head. And then I just, then I start to write and I, I'm very specific. Like I, I, just try to write a little bit every day. You know, I set myself a page uh, or, or a word count and I just try to stick to that every day. And I write that, that amount. Uh, some, if I'm, things are going really well, maybe I'll write a little more, but I, I don't write less and I just do it every day and I make it as much a part of my life as making breakfast or brushing my teeth or having a shower. You know, I write. And I think that, that it's really easy to make writing this kind of like mystical sort of thing, but I try to, um, when the actual writing happens, the craft side of it, try to make it as normal and every day and unspectacular as possible. It's just every day I spend a certain amount of my day writing that amount of words. And piece by piece, you chip it together until you have a finished draft. And so there's both this kind of like grand cosmic, like thinking about things and researching and having ideas swirl around in my head. And then there's the actual just hard writing, which is very, very matter of fact in every day. Mm -hmm. And do you find that... Um your screenwriting skill and, and expertise, did it, do you think it helped you writing a novel or did it hinder or was, you know, like, was there a, a connection between the two? Yeah. I mean, no, I think it helped a lot. I mean, look, every screenplay you've ever read is written in the exact same way. Like, like 
whether a movie is uh, a historical epic or a horror film or a comedy, like all screenplays are written in the same style. You know, they're written in the uh, third person. They're written in the present tense. They have a, a sort of a very objective view of the character. Like you're not writing a lot of internal psychology because you're only describing the things on the page that you can actually like shoot and act and, you know, that can be seen and experienced on screen. So um, it's got a very, and it's a very lean writing style. You know, you, you are, you trying to create an audiovisual experience with the fewest words possible. Now, all of those things impacted me. I mean, what was great about writing a novel is I wasn't hindered by any of those like structural limitations. I could write the book however I wanted, but I still, that, 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 um, rigor of using the fewest words possible to have, create the, the, the most vivid visual and emotional experience. I really, you know, I, even though a, a book is a lot longer than a screen, than a, than a screenplay, I, I tried to never waste any words. Every word is there for a reason. And, um, I, I think that discipline from screenwriting, um, really helped as well as like Screenwriting is very, it, even though you're writing words, it's a very, you're, you're writing a visual experience. And so as a writer, uh, as a novelist, I'm always thinking like, what do I want the reader to be picturing in their mind right now? You know, you're not going to go into a movie theater or, or, or turn on your television and experience this story. You're going to experience it on the page, but I still want to create a movie in your mind. What do I want? What exactly do I want you to be seeing right now? Um, which is not to say that I want to be like, you know, be sort of totalitarian and force your brain to only see what I want you to see. Part, I think, of the art of a novel is like, what I what do I be really specific about? And where do I want the, 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 the reader to fill things in themselves? Like, for, I'll give you a, a, an example. I, I'm very sparing with character description. Um, I want you to know through the way, through the dialogue, through the choices the character makes, through the things they think and the way they see the world. I want you to have a very, very clear sense of who they are. But I rarely give a lot of physical description unless it's important to the plot. And, and the reason for that is I want you to imagine they look like whoever you want them to imagine, whoever you want them to look like. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to force that on you uh, unless there's a very specific plot point tied into some physical attribute. I like it when the reader fills that in themselves. It's fascinating to me when people have a very strong sense of what, what a character looks like, because I, often that's coming from them, not me. At right. the same time, my job is to make as, the character as vivid as possible so that your brain fills in the blanks. And so that, that, but that tension does, from screenwriting, it, it's different as a screenwriter because eventually you're going to cast the movie and that character will look like whoever the actor is. Right. And so but at the same time, um, it's a discipline that you develop as a, as a screenwriter, which is to make a character feel very, very vivid, even though you don't know who they're going to be until the caster, until the casting and, and director get into, in, into the game. Right. And so this is th th that's an interesting segue into a, a question around, you know, if this book was to become a movie, mm -hmm. then you're taking your dystopian and utopian kind of things that you've created and you're making it real and how yeah. how 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 do you feel about that how do you feel about the book becoming visual well i think it's it's a different way of telling the story i mean i've sold the movie rights and i actually i adapted the book myself into a script and we're we're working on turning it into a film uh we're still in the middle of that process but it's just it's just a different way of telling the story. Just like you have less pages to tell the story in, you're telling the story in a different way. So um, you can you can convey all this stuff visually that you can't convey on the page. Uh, and so it's, so it's just it's like you're, you're approaching the character and the themes and the ideas of the book and just in, in a different medium. And so I, I I I'm I'm comfortable in both media, and it's just a different way of telling the story that's important to me. And. That must be unique, though. Like a lot of novelists are not screenwriters. So when their novels get optioned for movies, somebody else comes in and goes through that process. And you're getting to do that on your own work. That's right. Yeah. And you have the skill of doing that. So. That, that must be a very unique and also gratifying experience. It is. It is. It can be a challenge, too. I mean, there is like I, I, I understand the value of having somebody come in that isn't totally embedded in the story and having a bit of more of a mercenary attitude about what can stay and what can go. But no, I, I feel really um, grateful that and lucky that I'm, I'm because I have both skill sets. I'm able to sort of shepherd the project from one one version to another. Yeah, that's really neat. Did writing your first novel, was there any feeling of, you know, I'm now a real writer, if you know what I mean? Like, was there... Was um, 
I would say that that perception would be more public than personal. Like definitely, I think the public perceives novelists um, in a very different way than screenwriters. I mean, few people in the public, even, other than the most famous ones, even really know screenwriters because you are concealed behind the actors and to a lesser extent the director, right? Like the re the the uh, 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 film audiences experience a story through the actors. That is just the process, right? Whereas the relationship you have with a novelist is much more intimate. Um, you are reading the words that they wrote. It's like a form of like emotional telepathy. And so I think that there's just like a much more direct, and people also, you're literally reading the words. So, I mean, I could write the greatest screenplay of all time, and if the movie turned out to be crappy, you'd think it was a, a bad script, right? And I, I have written films that did not turn out the way I, I hoped they would. Um, I mean, the, I was lucky with the F word. I'm really, really proud of that movie, but I've written other movies where like the, the movie does not reflect my screenplay. Um, and But where if you read the novel, you whether you... If you read the novel, you might love it, you might hate it, you might fall somewhere in between, but you will know from reading it what you think of my writing. And so it's not so much that I I, I didn't feel any different, but I can I understand that the perception is totally different because you experience it different, differently. Uh, yeah, that, that that's a very good point. So, Alon, how can people, uh, if people want to connect with you or check out your work, how, how can people uh, get in touch with you? Well, I, I mean... I have a website, elanmastai.com. There's information on there in terms of about my work. Um, I'm on uh, Twitter at Elan and um, that's you, you know those are, those are those are good ways. The website's a really good portal for finding my work. I mean, of course, I, I encourage people to read All Our Wrong Today's, which was uh, published by Penguin Random House, and um, you know the F word. If you're in Canada or what if, if you're in the U.S., is available uh, all over the place. Netflix, iTunes, wherever wherever fine movies. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do our listeners a bit of a favor. I'm just gonna spell that out. So it's E L A N M A S T A I dot com is where you can uh, see uh, anything that we've talked about probably today or get connected with it. And then I just wanted to ask you about you know what you're doing these days. Is there anything of interest or anything that you can share? I mean, mostly I'm working on a new novel, uh, so I'm I'm in the middle of uh, writing that, and hopefully uh, going to be finishing in the next couple months. Uh, so that's been my a big creative project. I'm also working on some film and television projects, a couple of movies and a TV show. Um, I'm actually speaking to you from Los Angeles at the moment, where I am, uh, and yeah, so I'm just kind of like pushing those forward. Uh, hopefully some interesting stuff and in, uh, to announce in the, in the coming months. And, you know, if you follow me on Twitter at Elon Mastai or check my website, you'll, you can hear about any of that kind of stuff. Really cool. Well, I've really appreciated chatting with you today. I've enjoyed uh, learning about your process and the way that you see the world. Um, I really am grateful for your time and taking the time on the other side of the, the continent to uh, spend some time with us. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Great talking with you. All right. Take care. Cheers. Well, that's another episode of Listen In. Thanks for being. Please subscribe, leave comments, or head on over to our website at listeninpod.com. That's listen with two N's, pod.com, where you'll find episode notes, links to anything that we talked about in this episode, and you can connect with us about being a guest on Listen In.